You are listening to a Fangirls Going Rogue Priority Transmission. Welcome to a special bonus episode of Fangirls Going Rogue. Trisha and I were invited to three Star Wars fan site roundtables ahead of Star Wars The Bad Batch Season 3 premiere. So we present to you one of those roundtables. This is a conversation with head writer and executive producer Jennifer Corbett and supervising director and executive producer Brad Rao. Now, we recommend you watch the first three episodes of The Bad Batch, airing on February 21st, if you don't want any spoilers. Enjoy! Yep, yep! Hi, Jennifer and Brad. Um, the Clone War, The Bad Batch, excuse me, is ripe with imagery of water. We have the Camino Planet, Season 2 open with the Crab Heist. We have the frozen water of the Outpost. We have Pabu. And I seem to see these watery images popping up in season three. Could you talk a little bit about water as a storytelling element in this show? You got to stay hydrated. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, uh, we are always just looking for different landscapes uh, for the the show to take place that is uh, cinematic. But in terms of uh, Pabu in general, I'll say uh that during the pandemic when we were making season <laughs> two i think we were all going a little stir crazy and wanting to go on a vacation so pabu was very much our dream come true and we got very obsessed with the sushi on pabu and how we can make it as realistic as possible <laughs> is kind of our mission we we're going a little stir crazy <laughs> a, little, a little crazy hello i want to thank you both so much for the incredible series that is a bad batch season three is is fabulous what we've seen so far but before we go forward i'd like to get your thoughts on the loss of tech specifically how audiences received it it was so beautifully done and full of pathos that must have been very bittersweet and gratifying it was really hard um to be honest uh when we as we conceived the story we were coming up with the story for the end of season two we knew if we're going into tarkin's home base if you're going to go into the lion's den there's going to be a price to pay or it's not realistic and we didn't do any we didn't do anything lightly it, several discussions so much time went into figuring out how that was going to go and you know tech he he did the noble thing he's he's he, he he sacrificed himself for the rest of his family and i'll tell you how many times we've you know, read the scripts and shot the scenes literally hundreds and hundreds of times through editorial and music and working with D D and Michelle through that whole that whole moment. It's it always choked us up every every single time. So it was uh, it was a it was a big deal and pretty incredible to see the fan reaction. And and the loss of of tech is very much talked about. You know, throughout season three and very present in the characters and how they're dealing with that hole in their lives hi guys um there's a delicate balance between the characters and the broader galactic story that's going on in season three indeed in all the seasons of the show how do you decide and how do you choose the balance between the two because i imagine it's very easy to get caught up in the characters as much as it's very easy to get caught up in this broader history that's being built well, now that it's the final season, it is that balancing act, and uh, it's how do how do we make sure that we are focusing mostly on the characters' journeys, but also give a uh, fulfilling and uh, and worthwhile um, mission that they can um, take part in for the end. Hi, this is Keith and Kerwin from Father Sun Galaxy. Hello there. Hi. One of our favorite episodes of season two, season two was the outputs. Can you explain how you developed the story and why you chose a vulture to represent Crosshair as a vicious creature trying to find a way to survive? Well, that that's one of our favorites too. Um, uh, even though Crosshair didn't have many episodes in season two, we wanted the ones that he was in to be very impactful. And he wouldn't have gotten to this point if it weren't for the episode with Commander Cody also in season two. Um, the Vulture, which was also voiced by D. Bradley Baker. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he does everybody. Um, yeah, it was just, again, the Vulture is a survivor, and the Vulture is this solitary figure as well. So uh, that imagery was very much intentional, and uh, a lot went into that story. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that you like it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of our favorite episodes. We were really, really 
intentional with how close the vulture is to the camera at what point in the story and how close the vulture was to the ground at what point in the story. We actually shot way more footage of the vulture. At one point, Jen said, Brad, I think there's too much vulture in the episode. You're right, Jen, you're right. So yeah, it's uh, it, it was very symbolic. Yeah, William Devereaux, Ion Cannon Podcast. The dynamic between Crosshair and Echo is so well written, especially in the first half of season three. There's a lot of heart despite everything that Crosshair has put them through. How did you approach writing this, their dynamic between these two characters in, in the final season? Well, Crosshair has a lot to make up for, and he has still to go through and process the things that he's done. And it's never easy to admit when you're wrong. And what I love about season three is that we're with him as he's going on this journey and guiding him is Omega because Omega is the one who can see things very clearly, but also how the squad embraces him or doesn't embrace him initially is very much true to their character and also why they feel this way. Um, but yeah, and, and, and that relationship with him and everyone uh, will continue to uh, evolve in the episodes you guys haven't seen yet. Yeah, some of my favorite moments in season three are conversations between Omega and Crosshair. It's just wait for it. It's incredible. Hey, hey, we are Richard and Sarah from Skywalking Through Neverland, and we wanna we wanna tap into this water theme. Mm -hmm. As Omega is held in her room in Mount Tantus, which she's told is not a cell, we see water continuously dripping from the faucet. And that can have so many symbolic meanings, but we'd really like to hear from you and what you guys think it means or wanted it to mean. Hmm. Well, maybe we won't answer 100%, but it it, it is very s symbolic. Um, and we always wanted this sense of sort of monotony in that episode. You don't really know how much time has passed in Jin's awesome script. When I was talking to Saul Ruiz, who was the episodic director for that episode, it was an idea that he came up with, with his story team. Like, oh, Saul, incredible, because we were trying to find a way you know, when do we put in the music? When do we not have music? And in that little room that she's in, it's not technically a prison, but it's a prison. Um, how do we, how do we convey that? So when the team, and this is just an example of how we make every episode, we're constantly collaborating with all of our storytellers behind the scenes to get the image on frame, to get the sound just the way it's got to be. And that reverberated all the way, you know, literally all the way through the episode to the end when we were doing the mix at Skywalker Sound with David Collins and it was a, Collins the the drip we need like a little bit more reverb and then he had all of his ideas for when we hear it as well we talked a lot about that dripping water actually hi this is Alex from Star Wars Explained uh Mark already kind of touched on this but I've been so impressed with how well you've balanced a very focused personal story with the Bad Batch uh, with also the big galactic story of all clone troopers. Is that a story you knew you were going to tackle from the beginning of this series? Or is it something that developed over the full three seasons? We've sort of, uh, at the beginning of season one, it was, yes, this is a story about the Bad Batch, but it's also about the story of um, the, the end of uh, the clone trooper program and what that looks like in Star Wars because I, as I said before, I, as a fan, always asked what happened to the clones after the war, because I, I don't, I, you want, we don't see them later. So we wanted to just focus again on leaning into that veteran aspect and what that looks like um, and how that also affects the batch, because even though they're not with the empire and they're not part of it, they are still clones and those are still their brothers. So again, it, making it as personal as possible uh, for the characters and, and for the ones telling the story. George Rosario's Holocron, thank you so much for speaking with all of us today. Um, yeah, I had a question about the connections that the Bad Batch has to other Star Wars stories and, and broader lore. It was obviously a very intimate story, um, the season involving Omega and Crosshair, but there's also all sorts of other connections and references to um, other Star Wars, corners of the Star Wars galaxy. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how those connections come to be and if it warrants collaborations with filmmakers and other creators beyond the, the core team of the Bad Batch. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, when we early days on all of our episodes, we were always talking to Dave Filoni and he has such great insight and he's a great leader and, and friend and mentor to us. Um, we also have access to the Lucasfilm story group, which will from time to time, you know, give us a note about something based on another show. But we are 
it's it's interesting at this time the timeline of the bad batch there's not a lot of other shows right exactly happening or other anything happening right at this moment of the bad batch so it gives us a little bit of freedom but then when we get into something like mount tantus speaking of big big ideas and, and big lore it gets really it gets really tricky and so we're very careful that our personal character story doesn't step on something or contradict something else that has happened elsewhere Hi, I'm Caitlin from Sky Talkers. So great to speak with you both today. My question is, was it fun to write Crosshair and Omega's dynamic this season? And how is her relationship with Crosshair different from the rest of the Bad Batch? Uh, uh, yes, I love writing the two of them together because they are the odd couple. Um, he comes off as very negative and she comes off as very positive. So anytime that these two can learn from one another, uh, I'm all for and I think it's also just uh, with everything that Crosshair has been through and feeling like he was used, feeling that he was abandoned to be then paired up with this kid who shows nothing but empathy and never gives up on him. Uh, it's yeah, I, I love I love their dynamic and um, I just love the two of them together. And Dean and Michelle took to that so <laughs> much. They love that dynamic and they they put they pushed it in all the in all the right directions. And I I would say, you know, yeah, everything you're saying, Jen, it's so interesting how they each affected each other, not just Omega affecting Crosshair, but how Crosshair affects Omega is, is pretty fascinating, actually. I wanted to talk about Fennec Shand. Was she always in the plan or did you end up in a space and realize that she fit the story you were telling? I'd say a little bit of both because we knew that bounty hunters were a particular part of a, a storyline and since we had seen Fennec Shant interact with Omega in the Bastion season one she was a, a natural uh, character to kind of slot in there and also just uh, that uh, her personality versus uh, Hunter and Wrecker is just something that I'd, I'd pay to see um, and uh, again any chance to work with Ming-Na we'll take because she's phenomenal. So obviously we're not going to spoil anything because that would be a big no-no. Uh, I want to share also the the appreciation as as my esteemed peers have, have echoed throughout the intricate level of detail and storytelling that also makes sure to advance character development in a very profound way. It's, it's quite Shakespearean in a way that I, I really love. And I realize this is not a fair question, but are there certain members of the Bad Batch that speak to you more than others? I like that you're framing me who's your favorite one in a different way. <laughs> it's impossible. Um, I well, yeah, I I can appreciate Hunter quite a bit because um he's the leader of the squad, but he carries a lot of weight on his shoulders. And he's not always the most vocal, but he's trying to keep the family together. And uh, kind of see what like everything that weighs on him, especially in the beginning of season three, with the loss of tech, with Omega missing. Um, I, it's just it's it's a it's someone I understand because I would say if that were my kid, I would do this. So I, I'm on board with the decision that Hunter's making. Yeah, and I mean, I'll just add, you know, I mean, this, the Bad Batch has the Space Dads and Omega as a father myself. There's a lot of times where it's interesting how different members of the Bad Batch react to Omega that are coming right from my heart, coming from our heart as, you know, as creators behind the scenes, relating to things that, you know, that we encounter in our own lives. Yeah, there's nothing like, and Hunter's the classic dad, but, you know, speaking, we've been talking about Crosshair and Omega. There's a couple of moments where the dad side of Crosshair is quite interesting. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I wanted to talk about tech again. Uh, so, how long did it take for you to decide that it was going to be tech that was going to execute Plan 99? I don't know about how long. It was more of convincing ourselves that it had to happen um, because we love him so much. Uh, but it, in thinking about it and thinking about the squad dynamics, tech is very much what I call like the squad navigator. And when you take him out of the equation, that affects everyone in the squad. He would always keep everybody moving, be very factual about what they needed to do. And you take that out and now everything kind of unravels. So now not only do they not have tech, 
they don't have Omega and Echo is, you know, off on another mission with Rex trying to uncover other information. So it's really the effect of the squad is them being fractured at the beginning of season three. And we deal with that emotional fallout throughout the season that, that we're missing our brother and our, our teammate and our crew, our crew member. And it, it affected us behind the scenes the whole time, even, you know, just adding piggybacking off what you're saying, Jen, there were times when there was a moment that, you know, check could have been really useful in getting out of this jam. So we had to solve the problem in a, in a different way. It, uh, it, it, he, he was a huge, huge, huge character and his loss is not lost on us. That's for sure. Uh, the show's ending. Uh, it's as slick and smooth and confident as any Star Wars show has ever been. So how does it feel to you as people behind the scenes to end the show when you're in such a rich vein of form? Oh, thanks a lot. That's an awesome compliment. I mean, we've had such a blast. Jen and I were honored and, you know, we're proud to be able to represent the literally hundreds of people that have been working on this show at Lucasfilm and CGCG and Skywalker Sound and Team Kiner with the amazing music. Our entire cast is beautiful. Um, we Sometimes we say behind the scenes, even though it's hundreds of people, it's like we all became this weird bad batch behind behind the scenes as, as well. And so to end the story is certainly bittersweet, but we're really proud that we were able to do it on our terms when we knew this is going to be our, our final season. We were able to land it the way we wanted to. So we hope you all and all the fans like it as much as we do. I'll say as as a storyteller, you always have a vision of what a product is going to be. And sometimes it doesn't live up to, well, I that's not really what I, what I thought. This show has gone above and beyond everything. And that is a testament to the cast and, and the crew. Yeah, thank you again for taking the time to talk with us. Omega's high M count, which I think we're all reading through the lines, probably is midi-chlorian count, um, uh, implies that she has the force or at least a high affinity for it. Uh, of course, in the first two seasons, there have been many moments where she seemed to have either be very talented or have some connection in some way. Uh, of course, you know, without spoiling anything, how can how did you approach laying the groundwork for this reveal throughout the previous seasons? Well, I'll say anytime you mention that word, <laughs> I think a lot of people perk up. Um, all we can really say is that I know a lot of you have questions about that and things will be answered, you know, at, through the end of season three. Um, but it is a balance that we're trying to strike because it's, um, we have to be very conscious of, of what we're saying and, and what the things that you're hearing mean. Um, so without spoiling too much, that's, that's an answer or a non-answer. <laughs> yeah, a lot and a lot went into every single time you hear any of those kind of words and what it means and how that comes to be. It took a lot of, a lot of careful planning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to see you all. Awesome. Good job. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yep, yep. Thanks for listening. Make sure you listen to the other two roundtables on our feed with the voice of Omega, Michelle Eng, and voice of the Bad Batch, D. Bradley Baker. We also recommend the latest episode 24.2 of Fangirls Going Rogue because it contains Trisha and my thoughts on the Bad Batch season three premiere and a deep dive into the storytelling and music of the show. So until next time, yub, yub. This site is not affiliated in any way with Lucasfilm Limited LLC, the Walt Disney Company, or any of their affiliates or subsidiaries.